And what's up, y'all? Welcome back to the Chris Allen Show. Uh, we have a great guest for y'all today, a very, very special guest. My father-in-law, uh, Rod Ambrose, uh, a.k.a. Rodimus Prime. This man has one of the most exciting, eclectic life stories I've ever heard in my life. This man uh, was a gangster, <laughs> a thespian, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award winner, uh, an activist, uh, in the Nation of Islam, he knew Louis Farrakhan. He's met uh, Martin Luther King. He's met almost every well-known black civil rights leader you could think of. He has so many stories. And uh, I would say the best thing this man has ever done with his life is had my wife. <laughs> he fa He's the father of my that's, wife, that's, Kalila. Yeah, that, that's probably uh, what, to agree to the that. biggest achievement. <laughs> yeah. So welcome, Dad. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, I would love to have you a bunch of times, but today I know I want to discuss uh, your your introduction to the civil rights growing up in Chicago. And if you can, maybe tell us some stories about maybe when you met MLK. And I would really like you to tell the people the story when you were in the nation and you had to have that crazy ass meeting with the KKK. But hmm. let's start from the beginning. Born and raised in Chicago. Yep. Uh, you grew up a Christian, right? You grew up yep. a Christian. Uh, Baptist. Ba grew up Baptist. So let's mm -hmm. talk us through your, your childhood a, a little bit and how you became introduced to, to like the civil rights movement and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, let me first of all just thank you, Chris, for oh, having on. me on and giving me all these accolades that I <laughs> probably only partially deserve uh, because most of any achievement in my life was due to the people that were closest to me right. cooperating or me cooperating with them. So, mm -hmm. uh, But, yeah, I have to admit that Kalila was a, a special uh, moment in my entire life. Uh, and she has reproven her dad over and over again. Uh, I'll tell you, I started, uh, I was born in Chicago in a half century mark. My grandmother was born in 1900. My father was born in 1919. My mother was born in 1925. And I was born in 1950 at the half century mark mm -hmm. in the in the world here and i was born in poverty uh with parents that were trying to make it just like every other so-called negro family at the time uh i had a, a loving childhood i lived with my grandmother my aunts my uncles, I was a product of a lot of aunties and, mm -hmm. and uh, women that took care of kids right. uh, all the time. Uh, I grew up on Motown and saw Motown reviews regularly in Chicago. I, I rode the L train from the time I was 11 years old all around the city every weekend. I had hustles because Chicago is the city of the big hustle. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody got three or four jobs or some kind of hustle going right. on. And from the time I was 12, I was selling jet magazines on the L train. Now, that started, I think that's significant because I think that's my first little foray into understanding that there was blackness here and that it was important. It was in a little book right. that back then was 25 cents. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, the old paper stand man on the corner of 63rd Avenue Street in Halstead in Chicago, old white man, asked me one day, I came to get my usual allotment of comic books and candy from his little stand. Right. And he asked me how I would, if I would like to make money. And I said, yes, sir, how? What do you mean? He said, you see all these little books? These are jet magazines. And your people, I can't get to them because uh, look at me. He says, but I bet you if you got on that L train where people are traveling from home to work and so forth, you could sell these magazines on the L train. 
And I said, okay. And so he gave me a stack of them and gave me a chain dispenser that I put on the front of me on a belt. Mm -hmm. And I got on the train and I'd go sell Jet magazines. I had a friend to come along with me, um, Daryl Pledger, once. And Daryl wanted to know how I made so much money. I had change all the time, you know. And he said, "Uh, how did you? I said, selling Jet magazines. He said, well, how do you do that? And I got on the train. I said, I'll show you how. Every black person on the train, I'd go down the line and just give it and drop it in their laps and then get to the other end of the train. And then I take turned them around and say, look back. What you're going to see is them taking the book and turning it up like this. All the males do it, you know. Right. And uh, I, I said, he said, Really? What? How come they do that? I said, you'll see. You know, <laughs> and, they, and soon they were all doing this. <laughs> mm-hmm. They were looking at the beauty of the week. The jet beauty of the week, The man. beauty yeah. of the week. And that's what all the males would get the book just for that. Okay. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that out. You know, I figured that out. And, uh, well, I'd sell a bunch of them every time we went out. Well, that was just one of the things. We took wagons to the Dale Farm store and I hauled groceries, 35 cents, a dollar, dollar fifty. If you want me to take them three blocks, give me another quarter, I take them upstairs to the third floor, uh, stuff like that. I, I took everybody's customers of my friends, so they were always after me. Oh. <laughs> I was I was up earlier than them. Right. And I would get there because I loved doing it. Mm-hmm. I didn't see it as, as they complained. I didn't. I'd love uh, meeting the people and carrying their groceries. And, right. And they would look for me. They would look for me. Even when they were there, they were asking for me, mm-hmm. you know. And so I learned something about that, a shovel snow. Shovel snow in the wintertime, did uh, lawns and leaves in the s- summertime, in the fall. You know, I did those things to earn money. Uh I was 12, 13, 14, uh, those things were happening. My mom died when I was 13 uh, in 1963. And I always say that 1963 was my most tragic and, and consequential year in my life. Right. And the reason why is because the pastor of my church, Reverend William H. Johnson was friends with Medgar Evers. And our first Black History Month program at our church, the Greater St. John Baptist Church, he was bringing his best friend to talk with all us kids uh, about what he did. And they talked about growing up in Mississippi and having to hike more than 15 miles to school and back and that they both joined the military at the same time. They both became chaplains in the military. Right. And then Medgar Evers came out and began to run and do activist work in Mississippi, becoming the field marshal for the NAACP in Mississippi and causing a lot of duress to the local whites that were there. The big thing about this story was he was so funny and so good looking and dressed well. And I remember about that period of time, how well the people dressed and how they presented themselves. That might not have meant very much until I was older. And I thought back, I reflected once I was older on how young they were, the civil rights. Yeah. Drivers, they were in their 20s. Yeah, they were They kids. were in their 20s, and they were up against something that was horrific uh, when it came to us in our community. Violence against blacks was all over the place, uh, and they were in the storm. They went into the eye of the storm, you might say. But we were kids. Uh, when I first... Uh, met Dr. King, and before I met him, first of all, he would appear on television in black and white, and there'd be adults in the living room watching, 
And I'd hear my auntie say, oh, there that old fool is with his mouth wide open. He going to make it bad for colored people. About they used to say this about Martin. About Dr. King. Dr. King, wow. And then, uh, and I, we can't stand these country people. They come from the south and they slow and they dress in loud colors and they talk loud and they embarrass you. They, we don't wow. like to deal with uh, southern Negroes, you know. So I was only like twelve or thirteen, and I didn't quite understand. So, and I'm in earshot, and I say, "Well, well, Amy." Uh, didn't you all move up here from Alabama and Arkansas <laughs> and in the in the thirties? You know, right? And uh, they said, shut up, boy. They don't have they nothing to do with that, it. Huh? They didn't have nothing to do with it. Right. And uh, so it was. I, it just made me curious, more curious about what that movement was. Right. And I happened to be. I didn't go on purpose. I happened to be with two other friends. Chester and Reedy, my best friends, if they were out live and around, they'll probably hear this broadcast, and maybe I hope they will contact Chris. But they were, we all sat on the stoop at St. Raphael's Church. It's a Catholic diocese mm -hmm. in Chicago. And we had been playing basketball, and we were sweaty and hot, and we went and got some knee-high drinks. They, you know, all of us, three of us had our sodas. Right. And the man stepped out behind us out of the door, and he had on these robes that were so beautiful and eloquent, and they looked even kind of scary to us, you really? know, why he was dressed like that. Mm -hmm. And so we asked him, he said, well, hello, boys. And we said, well, why are you dressed like that? Uh, who are you? He, he, he said, I'm Father Clemens. Now, he was not the first, but one of the first African-American priests, Catholic priests in the country, wow. okay, in Chicago. He may still be there. He is over 100 probably and may still be alive. He looked better than me, you know, when I was in my 60s, you know, and— uh, but Father Clemens asked us if we wanted to help him because the civil writers were coming. That's how he said it. The civil writers were coming. The civil writers. And uh, we said, oh, you mean Dr. King? And they said, yes. He coming here? He said, yes. And he's going to help us march for jobs and fair housing. And we didn't know what either one of them things were so right. much, uh, but we thought it was good if Dr. King was doing it. Uh, and uh, he's, I said, well, Reedy said, well, will we be on TV? And uh, he says, well, I don't know. You might be on TV mm -hmm. because it'll be on the news. What do you want us to do? Go over in the projects and get out all your friends and tell them to come over and help us with the march. We were excited, excuse me. <coughs> we were very excited. We went up the stairs and we went all through the house banging on the doors. Come on out, come on out. Dr. King is coming, Dr. King is coming. We need to be there, we need to be there. And all kinds of youngsters came and uh, they followed us. We were like the Pied Piper. We, Brought, brought them to the house. It was a big, big room, looked like a warehouse. And we were going to have civil rights camp in that room. Right. And there were bunches of us, and we were sitting Indian style on the floor in this big room, and it had women standing at every door. They had double doors around the room, mm -hmm. and they had black chalkboards around the room, and they had songs written in chalk, white chalk, on those blackboards. They were lyrics to movement songs that they would teach us. And the first person that came in was Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. And he was the tallest human being I had ever seen. Really? How tall is he? He's about 6'5", something like that. Okay. You know. And uh, but that was huge to me, oh, especially yeah. if you're sitting and you're like on the floor looking up. Then he took a milk crate and set it in the middle of the floor and stood on it. So he was like a giant, 
right. know, and we were looking straight up at him. This is a young Jesse Jackson. Young, fiery Jesse Jackson. Dang. A good-looking guy, a statuesque kind of guy, he, you know. And uh, he says, I want you all to stand up because if you don't stand up for something, you'll fall for anything. Those are the first things I heard him say. Mm -hmm. Then he says, I'm going to teach you something, and I don't want you to ever forget it as long as you live. You all hear that? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Repeat after me. I am, I am. Somebody, somebody. I am, I am. Somebody, somebody. I may be black, tall. I may be tall. I may be small. I may be small, but I am, I am somebody. I am, I am somebody. I may be yellow, or I may be Asian, but on this occasion, I am somebody. I may be red and underfed, but I am somebody. I may be brown, but stick around. I am somebody. I may be black, but don't lose track. I am somebody. I learned that that day, all of us <clears throat> kids did, and we never forgot it. Mm. I sometimes flub some of the lines, but I, I have taught that to every major elementary and high school in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I have done the I Have a Dream speech along with teaching the students and the faculty these uh the I am somebody right uh and it's probably in the in the thousands thousands yeah thousands because I did it 40 times uh between 25 and 40 times every year for 40 years jeez that's sad. so and they expected to see me every year so that's what I did uh, to a fire department, police department, ASU faculty, you know, right. and all like that. One of the funny things is, you know, uh, if you're doing speeches like that from someone who's such a high example of a human being, people kind of expect you to be them on the spot. Like right, yeah. They, they kind of think you're like him. You know, mm -hmm. and I have to remind the kids, oh, no, 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 no. You're talking about somebody who is really extraordinary, and I am just mimicking him. Right. I say, I didn't have the intellect to actually write I Have a Dream, right, or any of his other speeches, but I learned about 15 of his other speeches by heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, so in that day... After Jesse Jackson, there was Andrew Young, and he stood up on the crate. Right. And he talked to us about what to expect, you know, and what we had to learn while we were outside and how to protect ourselves and keep ourselves from getting into trouble during the march. Um, we didn't have... Uh, the imagination, I don't think, to actually picture what he was telling us because you couldn't have that, the, the actual scene of marching when there are angry crowds of whites shouting and calling you niggers and go back to Africa and spitting on you and throwing bottles at you and so forth and so on, and rocks and things, and you having to duck. Uh, we were doing all right until Julian Bond stepped up and said, now, all of you, we're going to make signs. And we all got on the floor. This was really fun. To us, this was like recreation. You know, it was fun. We were making signs. We had color pencils and we had tempera paints and all of that making signs. Then they had slogans on the wall, on the uh, board that you could copy. Off okay. of, and we put them on our placards and then we had little tacks and little dowels and they gave us little hammers and we made little signs uh, during that time. Can I ask this question? Yes. Uh, so did... Um 
Would you say kids your age kind of understood the uh, civil rights movement to a degree? I mean, obviously you know what it's like to be black and you get treated a certain way, but did you guys really fully understand like uh, what the movement was really trying to do? That's a good, insightful question. And I say it like this. Uh, maybe on a surface didn't. level. I can we see didn't. It. Okay. Maybe others did. Right. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I didn't really know what to think. And I wouldn't allow myself to make any conclusions about what this was. I just wanted to experience it. And, uh, and I did, you right. know, I experienced it, you know, where, uh, what, what signals I was getting before then, it was all about love because I was drawn to it because it was a church and I was used to the oh, church. Okay. And so when he said, <clears throat> come go do this, we felt this is something good to do because it's with the church. It's associated with the church. Okay, right, okay. and uh, so I felt that it had to be right, you know, if it was with the church. I knew my family would not approve of me being there. I didn't tell them, you know. I just came back home like I did my normal route. I didn't understand civil rights at all. I didn't even know what the terms meant. I, I knew that we were marching for something very important and that I could be part of it. And it would make me special and important because I was a part of it. Okay, so you knew okay. it was special and big and needed to be done, but... Just not really understanding all the small nuances. I, I didn't understand any of the nuances uh, or when Julian Bond, when we finished our placards, he reminded us of the movie Ben-Hur. He asked us if we'd seen that movie. And we all said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's in Technicolor. This was huge. <laughs> yeah. This was huge. It's in technical. Yeah, this was huge. You know, you that's why you went to the movies back then, because the TV was in color. You know, the movie was in color. You see, this was a big deal. Mm -hmm. This was a really big deal. It's as big a deal as Cadillac making electric windows on cars. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this was huge. It was an avatar of your of your day. Uh, of like, of yeah. my time, <laughs> you know, and I was, whoa, you know. Yeah. Uh, that was a big yeah. production, Ben-Hur, wasn't it? Like, oh, yeah. Big, yeah, big, yeah, it was one of the big Hollywood yeah. movies. And, and he says, well, you remember how they, the enemy were shooting all the arrows at them, and what did they do? They put up their shields. Yeah. You put up your shields over your heads and stand close together and make one big shield for everybody. Wow. And this is what they taught us for going out when they're throwing bottles and rocks and things like that at us to put those up so that they would deflect them, that type of thing. But it was at that moment that a lot of our little guys, some of them were older than us they were teenagers mm -hmm. and when they heard that all i remember is somebody saying you mean they gonna throw stuff at us we weren't aware really we seen things on tv but that's not real life to us in our own place you know right and uh they said well yes well you mean they gonna hit us with stuff you know they said yeah well okay we ain't doing this, you know. Oh, wow. I'm sorry. You up in Chicago. Up in this Chicago, we don't take no shit off white folks mm -hmm. in Chicago. <laughs> they come in our neighborhood, we whooping their asses, you know, so forth. <laughs> you know, so so it was like that. And they just stormed out, and they got mad. They was angry. I couldn't quite understand what was going on. But they started throwing stuff and, and all of that, chairs, and start doing and uh, they all left, a whole bunch of them left. It was only about 30 of us kids, and we were younger kids that stayed. So these and are we actually teenagers. got a chance to see right. 
Martin Luther King Jr. cause we stayed. And he came later that evening and he came in a short sleeve shirt. What the? That's, cr- that's crazy. And he came in a short sleeve shirt. And from the time he entered the room, there were, I don't know, 20 something reporters with cameras and they were all like Polaroid cameras. And our first job was to take these big yellow cans and scoop these bulbs off the floor wherever they dropped them and load up those cans. Mm -hmm. They actually loaded up cans. That's how many shots they were taking of Dr. King, you know, coming in. And I remember it like it was yesterday. He was shrouded in a kind of white light, the light that you see from a camera flash. If you see 20 or 30 of them go off at the same time, well, that's an eerie type of thing. He's engulfed in this kind of glow or something. So what you see is almost kind of heavenly like, right? He walks in and every time he stops, they stop. They were taking pictures. Then it stops. And he stops, he stops, he speaks a little bit, then it starts all over again and the whole circle kept moving across the floor till somebody reached him and whispered in his ear, told him that these kids were in here and these were the kids that stayed. Mm -hmm. He came, he wanted to see us. He came, walked in, they were fixing dinner on the other side of these doors and these, these matronly old black women would purple hair and white gloves and white outfits, white dresses. Oh, were, usher outfits kind of? Yeah. Okay. They were in the room and they were fi- fixing dinner, a big dinner for Dr. King, a banquet that night. Us kids were going to be gone, mm-hmm. you know, when they did that. But it didn't happen <clears throat> like that because Dr. King came in, took the same crate that five or six others had addressed us from all day, and he turned it on the side and sat on it. He sat on it and he stared at us a long time. Man. And I got uneasy because I was sitting kind of up front. I felt funny. He how was close are we saying? Like how many? How no, close? no more than 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 seven or eight feet, maybe. You know, so we, you, we were close to him, kind of. That's crazy. And, and uh, he 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 stared. He was staring, and then he stopped and he. He apologized. He said, well, how you doing, Ken folks? And we were gone. Soon as he said that, how you doing, Ken folks? Mm. And then he says, I'm so proud of you kids for staying. Mm. You know, you look to me, I was staring. These are verbatim. I don't remember exactly how he said it, but this is, this is the gist of it. Mm. I I was staring because you look so beautiful to me. You look like a beautiful flower garden. And I know you represent the hope and the future of all of our people. He says, so I'm thanking you for staying and I'm encouraging you to follow this movement and help us, help us to build a better America. This was the things that Dr. King said. And uh, take your time. Well, uh, the next day we were marching and uh, we heard all of the anger I was I remember being shocked. I was in shock uh, hearing uh, what they screamed at us for no possible reason. Uh, And I didn't understand. I didn't understand racism. I couldn't understand it because my best friend lived next door and he was white. He was one who stayed, his family, and I later found out they couldn't afford to move uh, <laughs> right. with white flight, 
like mm-hmm. all the others did. Yeah. <laughs> so they were stuck. Yeah, they were stuck. <laughs> so he was stuck being my friend, mm-hmm. and his mom was my mom. My mom was his mom. Uh, my doctor that she took me to was white. My teacher was white. The, the, the things I looked at on TV, they were white, you know. I didn't understand. I didn't understand. Why was this happening? I, 1963 ripped the innocence from me. This is why I go back to it. It ripped my innocence from me. Mm -hmm. In February, that was Mega Evers. By June 12th, 1963, I'm watching the news with my grandparents, something I almost never do, but just happened to be sitting there. And they're rolling this man. We had just hugged and he laughed and talked with us and made us laugh. And they were dragging him out in a black bag from his own driveway. And I nearly fainted. I didn't know what on earth would somebody killed that man for. So Pastor Johnson had to call all the parents and brought us in and sat down and counseled with us and talked to us about racism. So let me get this straight. So you met Megger Evers in a February and then June he had been murdered. Right. Wow. Just that fast. And, uh, <laughs> That was my first rude awakening that this racism stuff was not good, uh, that uh, it's in the country and it's like a disease or something. And I I didn't understand it. To me, that would have been the zombie eclipse to me Mm -hmm. at that age and looking at the world because I thought the world was a Christian world. I thought, you loved everybody, and you did what Jesus said. Love ye one another, even as I have loved ye. I believed this stuff. You know, I was growing up to believe this. Yeah. You know, love thy neighbor as thyself. I was believing that because I had a neighbor I loved like myself. Right. You know, and he was white. You know, my other friends wouldn't play with him. But I would. Right. You know. And, yeah, uh, that was a rude awakening by, what was it, June, July, something. I think, I don't, I've forgotten the date, I'm sorry. It's, that's all right. Um, You're talking about the 60s. That was a long yeah, time ago. Was, uh, so but June 63? I saw America, yeah, 63. Uh, it was July. It was July of 63, I think, mm-hmm. uh, when... On American Bandstand, they featured someone who would would really just turn up the volume on hope and identity for young Negro kids at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Stevie Wonder. Okay. I watched Stevie Wonder... <clears throat> and everybody watched it. It was the first time I saw a, a Negro kid, the same age as me, on a television program, and he was singing and playing music, and he was blind. And that was so extraordinary to most of us. It sort of developed this thing of confidence because he could do that, and he was one of us. Music is powerful, man. You know, and I felt, oh, my goodness, you know. Uh, it was so enlightening to me at the time. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether people really realize how vital Stevie Wonder has been to our country, our people, he has had so many wonderful messages, and he was so brilliant, right. you know, during that time. Well, the next month, August 28th, was the March on Washington. And I watched it on my living room floor 
with a room full of adults watching the entire march. Right. And I remember just being stunned and realizing I know him. I've met that man. You know, I felt something. I felt a connection with all those people because of him, because he was there. And I had been with him, you know, right. that type of thing. Then, of course, the next month, uh, four little girls were murdered uh, yeah. in, the, in their church. I didn't realize much about that until, that was September 15th. 1963, and by September 21st, a car rolled up to my house in Chicago. My great-grandma was sitting on the porch, and I sat on the stairs when this long car, a Bonneville or something, uh, rolled up, and people got out. I didn't know who they were, but they, just a man and a woman and their child who was the same age as me. Right. He happened to be my cousin Charles. Mm -hmm. My cousin Charles and I sat on the front porch uh, while the adults went inside. Uh, and uh, we got acquainted with each other. And he asked me, what do you all do up in this Chicago? And I said, well, we have lots of fun up in this Chicago. We go everywhere I do. I go anywhere I want to. I ride the L train by myself. He said, no way. I said, yeah, he said, my parents won't let me go anywhere, you mm -hmm. know, and he talked a little while. Then he says, uh, I have a secret. And, and I said, oh, okay. And he says, I can't tell you. I say, well, why you tell me you got a secret? You can't tell me. And then he says, give me one of your comic books and I'll tell you. Now I had a billion comic books, right? Right. And, uh, and I pulled out about 10 of them. I say, take one. No, you can't take that one. No, you can't take that one. Yes. <laughs> no, you can't take that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, he says, you don't even want me to have one of your comic book. I say, okay, take this one. I think I got two of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and he says, I say, now tell me the secret. He says, well, uh, you know, there was a children's marching in Birmingham last May. I said, no, I don't know nothing about that. He says, we were marching in Birmingham because the, the parents couldn't march. And Dr. King and the civil rights movement needed to do something else after Rosa Parks in 1957, where they were successful Right. Uh, in their boycott of mm -hmm. the bus line in Montgomery, Alabama. But they hadn't done anything on a, that would catch the national attention since then. Mm -hmm. So this is why they were in Birmingham. And the plan was to get all those people and get them marching through Main Street, street downtown in Birmingham. But the black folks once... Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy came, they got cold feet. They, they realized, but if I get seen marching down Main Street, I'm going to get fired. If I get seen, they're going to take my car back. If I get seen, they're going to do foreclosure on my house. So the adults pull back. When they pulled back, it was what was the alternative? Well, Reverend Bevel, who actually was a brilliant uh, pastor and one of the uh, leaders in the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. said, why don't we let the kids march? And the, 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 the actual plan was to march, and they knew the police was going to arrest them. Right. When they got arrested, they would put more and more people until the jails were completely filled 
and they couldn't get any more. Mm -hmm. And it became a national disgrace by, by the time they were able to do anything about it. Damn. When they stood up, there is a, there is a video that any of your readers or listeners uh, could get that would show you the entire Birmingham Children's March. It's called 1993, and it's produced uh, by Teaching Tolerance. It's a series in educational centers, Teaching Tolerance. You can get all these kinds of civil rights movement movies and right. things like that. Okay. Well, it talks all about uh, that period of time, and you see the kids actually doing it, and the kids have actually grown up and tell you about who they were, where they were, and you had both pictures now, is when this, they were children and when wow. they were grown. Is this the same? Is. Not to cut you. Is this the same march where uh, that that famous photo of the of the dog biting the kid, but it turns out the dog wasn't biting the kid. It might be. It might I, be because it was that went on there. There's a famous picture of this. Yeah, holding this dog. Yeah, bag. I know. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I know what you, what you're talking about, and they called the dog nigger. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Dick Gregory was the one who recognized that. Dick oh, Gregory okay. was at that march. He he was at that march with the children, and he went in the head of the line with the children. Right. You know, against you know the judgment of people who were handling him and that type of thing, but uh, he was the one that realized what they were calling the dog. They called him nigger. Wow. He was a black German shepherd that they called nigger. Mm -hmm. And he was trained to bite black people. <laughs> to bite niggas. He would run through a crowd of white people at the black person wow. that was in the crowd. Uh, now, to ever see something, I've seen something like that before at my high school. And when they let the dog go, and they ran through, it was an all-white high school, okay? So they ran through us. it was only a handful of black men. It was 20 of us that, that actually integrated the school. Mm -hmm. It's called Limblum Tech High School. They know who they are. And they had a, a, a school of white privilege. My mom on her deathbed, when I was 13, left word that she wanted me to attend that school because of the high ratings and so forth. But colored students, Puerto Ricans, and other students of color could not go to that school. They had to beat the loophole that said you had to be at least of the 9.1 percentile in most of your course subjects on your SATs in order to go into that high school. Mm. The ones that passed were the ones that went to the school. I was one of those who passed. Oh, wow. So I went to this all-white Ivy League high school of privilege. They had every sport, every kind of thing you want to imagine that a kid could play. They rented polo horses. Oh, that's they a, did, Jesus, yeah. They did hockey, ice hockey. That's expensive, yeah. That's crazy. At a high school, we yeah. had we had fencing. <laughs> you know, we had fencing. You that's, know, that sounds like an Ivy League college. It was a serious, serious school. It's big. Looks like a college even to this day. It hadn't changed much at all. Is it now like a uh, like a uh, like a prep school, or do kids stay there? I don't know no. what they do now, but they, it was. Uh, sounds like a boarding school. It was a serious, serious school. We all came from wow. our neighborhood. We had to go into their neighborhood to get to the school That's, and that kind of thing. I remember my uncle driving me to school one morning. I didn't have to take the bus. I usually took the bus. And he said, well, I, so you got on into this school over here, didn't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, how you like it over there with all these white folks at the school? Because they don't like us being nowhere, you know. Right. And I said, oh, it's, it's fine, Uncle Cliff. It's fine. How's it? Uh, you don't get uh, heckled and they don't call you names. I say, well, they might. I don't pay much attention to it. I says, but they might. He says, well, well, how is it that you guys can get along? Because there's only a handful of y'all. There's thousands of students up there that are all white. 
And I said, well, we, we don't. He said, don't you miss each other? There's only a handful. I said, no, it's because, Uncle Cliff, we're all in the same room. <laughs> they put y'all on the same class? Yeah. Wow. The first school year, we all were in the same room, and the teacher came in. Oh, they, were, they wouldn't even let y'all leave and switch classes? No, no. No, they were managing that whole thing. Now, I have to say their their plan and how they executed it and how they were getting us integrated was effective. It was minimal disturbance stuff, you know, that we had to go through because they had us isolated like that. The next school year, they put us two by two by three into homerooms. Mm -hmm. So it'd be two of us or three of us in a homeroom. That's what they did. Oh, uh, okay. My mom and, went to an integrated school. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how they did. And uh, I remember being there and me and another brother who I didn't know at the time, but we ended up in the same class, mm -hmm. the same homeroom. It was the art teacher of all things because that's what I did. I was an artist. I I sketched and I painted in oils and I was – a student at the Art Institute for about a year when the, when I was 11 years old, and uh, I won a science fair uh, sketching uh, the human heart and uh, and labeling the parts and how it functioned by heart. Hmm. Um, that was my science fair exhibit, and uh, I remember winning and being the first Negro or colored student to win it in that region like that. right? And when I went to do it, my mom, who my daughter is so much like her, she has no idea. She took me everywhere, she did everything with me. I mean, when I was a kid, she'd eat the, the, the orange first and say, good, 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 and then she Give it to me. Right. She'd take it out of her mouth and put it in my mouth and say, good. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. good, good. She was that type of mother. Mm -hmm. Everything, detail in my life, she was in it. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and I didn't quite understand the benefit or uh, example she was, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Uh, but I knew that when she died, I was lost. You devastated? Yeah, I was Man. lost. I had no way. I I was so devastated. It was no way that I could come back and be all right. Uh, so when the movement came around, it distracted me uh, in some ways. It was a distraction, mm -hmm. you know, from the, the, the depression and the grief that I was carrying around with, with the me. loss. Yeah, it was a, a distraction. Mm -hmm. So it made me pay more attention, I guess. Right. You could say. Okay. And, uh, um, but yeah, it was really, that was 1963. Uh, so my cousin says, well, my secret is, you know, the when the, the church that got bombed with the girls, those were my best friends. And he started bawling. Oh, my gosh. He said, I sang in that choir. I didn't go that day because I had the flu. Wow. And my mom kept me home. And and uh, Wesley and Robertson and the other girls came by the house like we always did to pick me up. And my mom said I couldn't go. And the next thing we know, the house was shaking. And he says, and when we came outside, we saw from the two blocks away the smoke and all the stuff. And he says, so the Ku Klux Klan are targeting kids because of the Children's March in May, in which John F. Kennedy had to send down troops, and he had to change that narrative. Um, that's what happened during that time. Um, 
he said that he knew that they were targeting the children because the children made the march. The children successfully broke the Birmingham jail system. Within five days, they had over 4,800 children locked up in their jail. The jail was so full, they had to open the, the cow the cow range, the, the pens that mm-hmm. they keep cows and pigs in, and they kept the kids Jesus. In, in there. Yes, they did. And uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, and, uh, and they, that's and crazy. It closed down. That is insane, they, man. They got Bull Connor fired. They changed the narrative in Birmingham. The kids did. It's worth anybody's, anybody's time, especially, especially, uh, especially the kids, you know, especially Miles. Right. To see that thing. But I wouldn't do it unless it was somebody that could actually walk them through it, you know. Right, okay. To help them sense. with it because it's very intense. You'll yeah, see sure. the dog bi- bi- biting and so forth and so on. You'll right. see all of those things. But you'll also see the most courageous thing i ever seen in my life. Every time I watched the damn thing, I cried, Which, and I had to I had to play it almost every day. I was playing it for every high school, every elementary, junior high mm-hmm. uh, in the city, you know, to get them to understand this is what happened. And kids were the heroes mm-hmm. of the civil rights movement at that time. If it had not been for the march in Birmingham. With the children, over 4,000 arrested in four days, and they shut down the jail system. If that had not happened, then there would not have been a big successful march on Washington in August. Because when they started planning it, it was two different plans emerging. It was most of the five percenters or uh, people who were activists and militants, right. they were militants. These were the black militants planning a wa- march on Washington, and they were planning to do some damage when they went to Washington. <laughs> okay, and, and, and JFK and his brother Robert Kennedy said, oh, no. So that's when he says, well, who can we get to lead this march that ain't going to start shooting people and this, that, and the other? And Robert F. Kennedy said, well, um, what, what can we do here? You know, he says, well, who, who can, what can we do? And he said, well, get other leaders. So he says, why don't we try to get Dr. King and those civil rights guys? They're, they're churches, you know. They're not going to incite violence and rioting, and, uh, and that's what they did. So technically, the white power structure got its way with the March on Washington because those other guys didn't get a chance to lead. Mm-hmm. It was the big six that actually led and were considered the leaders, and that could happen because they knew that most of the black folks that were coming grew up in the church. Right. Okay, so that's wow. what they knew. All right, so you would have had, they expected with all of their planning, they expected to never get no more than 10,000 people in Washington on that day in August. That's all they could actually account for, uh, how they projected. The Children's March turned it into 250,000 because all the people who were watching the Birmingham March showed up at the March on Washington. Wow. I was once so stunned at the number of whites that were beaten, tortured, and lost their lives just because they stood with black folks. Mm -hmm. And I sat in the library one day and cried like a baby because I realized that I had castigated the entire race because of the supremacist views of those who operated 
a lot of our country. Right. And I didn't know how, nor did I want to separate them out. They were all the enemy. That's what the country had induced or had internalized me with how they hated black people. Mm -hmm. Once I realized and thought, oh, they hate black people so much, they will arrest and torture kids. You know, what does that person deserve but hatred back? And that's what I think the militants were saying. Oh, yeah. That I was do. the easiest, quickest, best response to somebody who is attacking you and using your color as the reason for their hatred. Right. So I learned if you hate me, I hate you. Okay. Well, so I don't want to, I don't know much about the nation, but I don't want to paint them as a hate group. I'm not going to do that as a, as a black person. I'm not going to do that. But would you say this, like, hatred, is this what got you into the nation? Like, how did you even go from being this loving Christian to now oh, joining joining the nation of Islam? Did that, some of your hate and anger, did that allow you to, to join that? Because, I mean, that's two different things, Christians and, and Muslims. Like, how did you even get there? That's a good question, and it's, it has an interesting answer that I only have time probably to give you a partial answer, uh, and that is we have to go from when I was first introduced to something of the nation of Islam. And I thank you for having the consciousness to understand and to know that they were not a hate group or what the white supremacists would want to think that we were. I first got introduced getting on the bus to go to school the first week of high school. A gentleman standing in front of the door of a store on the corner of the bus stop mm -hmm. stepped out. He had on a bow tie and a hat and a suit, and he stepped out and said, How you doing, young brother? You on your way to school, brother? And I said, Yes, sir. He said, hey, and he had the Muhammad, Muhammad Speaks. And he folded up and put it up under my arm and put my arm down like that. Mm -hmm. He said, take that with you, brother. And I got on the bus. I got on the bus. I started going through the paper. I stopped in the middle of the paper for some reason. And in the middle of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, if for those who know or don't know, is a picture of a white per woman and a black woman. The white woman dressed a certain way, the black woman dressed just like her. Right. But it said the shyness and the disgrace. And I wondered right away, what is that, right? I didn't quite comprehend that at mm -hmm. the time. Then I'd look up and he'd have, you know, the fall of America. All right, so that started to look, wild to me right and his picture was in the right hand corner upper corner of that page and he wore a kind of fez that looked like a crown with the with the crescent and stars mm -hmm, on yeah. it and i was intrigued by that picture i don't know for what reason even to this day but i sketched his picture really several times until i could sketch it by heart, both in charcoal and colored pencils. Wow. And uh, I remember my my grandmother asking me why I was sketching that picture. Did she and know who it was? She knew. And, yeah. we, and this was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh -huh. You know what's yeah. funny you say that? I, and this, is, this sounds so dumb compared to uh, mm -hmm. your experience, but I remember seeing his picture the first time in the movie, Malcolm X. Oh, and I kind of had the same. It was just something about this man in this hat. I go because I just wasn't used to really seeing anything it, like that. All the black people I knew were Christian, and here you have these black people, these right. Muslims. They don't. And I was like, man, these people pull 
pepperoni off their pizza. Like, that's all I really knew. Yeah. They don't eat pork, but I also knew these niggas don't fuck around. That's right. And that's they, right. back in the 90s, they used to that's do a right. lot of security. Like, if you wanted mm-hmm. to have a good party, you got the nation <laughs> to do your security because if the nation was there, wasn't nobody pulling on no guns, none of that. You could do what you want at your party. You can have alcohol, weed. Uh, they're not going to judge you for that, but wasn't nobody going to start any no, shit at your party? That's right. Your function. And that's really all I really knew about the nation was they don't eat pork and they do not fuck around. Well, my, that's it. My grandfather said, well, that old man is wise now. See, they don't like him, but he speaks a lot of truth and he's wise. That was the last thing I remembered about something about him. Mm -hmm. I had a book that I sketched, Angela Davis, H. Rap Brown. I did lifelike sketches of them. I was that good as a kid. I was very good uh, with charcoals and paints and stuff like that. And uh, I remember um, I was on my we were in art, my homeroom class was art. Mm-hmm. And my teacher was a old uh, guy that, he was a white guy that looked like Santa Claus. He, he had white mustache, white beard. He looked, in fact, he kind of looked like Santa Claus. And of course the students said that. They called you know, him Santa. And, yeah, and they, <laughs> you know, but he was not jolly. He was very, very uh, grumpy old man and uh, but that that day at school, we were in our first homeroom class. I sat here, and three rows over was this kid named Harold Branch. And we were the two Negroes in the homeroom class. Mm-hmm. I happened to be an artist too, though, like my homeroom teacher. So as he was finishing up on all of the where you go, when you go, when the bells ring, and all of the orientation stuff. Right. Uh, then he saw, he, he kept looking up, seeing me sketching in the back, you know, and he came back and he said, oh, we have an artist in our midst. Well, you're pretty good. Uh. Well, you have more of these, you know? And I said, oh yeah, I got a big tablet at home. He said, oh yeah, well, you want? Why don't you bring it to school and let me see some of the things? Maybe I can get you in my class. Would you like to be in my art class? You know, and I say, oh yeah, yeah. And then, so I was getting real, going out the door. So this new kid, you know, he comes up behind me. Harold Branch. Harold Branch. Okay. We're the last two out of the room, you know. And he said he was going out these double doors. You know, he said. That white man don't care nothing about your art, Negro. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, you just mad? You just mad because he didn't say nothing about you. Yeah. You just mad. <laughs> and so the next day, we come back. I got my art tablet oh, now. I'm pretty sure he don't want to see these. <laughs> I, I got my art tablet right here. And, uh, I bring it there. And he said, Oh, let me see here. Let me see. And he goes in. He opens it. Oh, 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 oh. Mm, uh, he opens it, turns the next page. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, then he turned to Elijah Muhammad. And he said, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't do that kind of artwork in here. We don't do that kind of artwork. You see, look around the room here. Look around. See, there's a guy that did Mickey Mouse. There's a guy that yeah, did a wow. bridge. Here's a girl that did a horse. This is a neat looking horse. You know, something like that. I say, I don't like to do that. I like to do people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, you can't do those kind of people in my class. And I'm not going to let you in my class if you're going to be doing this. I say, well, I do most of my sketches at my grandma's dining table anyway. So you, you don't know? care. I don't care. You know, wow. so, but of course, when we were leaving the class, he said, I told you, nigga, that white man ain't kidding about <laughs> you and your heart. That's now, funny. Yeah. Now, that's with 13, 14, 15, 16, he and I went into the Blackstone Rangers. So now they you were the now Blackstone you, so now Rangers. So you in a gang. Yeah. Okay. Back then, it was the largest, most notorious black street gang in america it was huge we owned uh we were covering all kinds of territory in chicago 
And uh, we had joined. We had joined. We were involved in it. Man. Uh, and both of us were kind of like, we were poets, you know, and artists. You know, he was a poet. He played yeah, the drums. What are y'all doing in the game? Yeah, we was like, you know, poets, you know, and... Uh, but we found ourselves in the gang. And, uh, Are y'all doing like uh, y'all doing Shakespeare when when people roll up on your territory? Like, Hark, who, go, who goes there? <laughs> it's almost like that. Probably some of the same kind of inference was there. You know, we we would paint. We were some of the first muralists because <laughs> we painted shit on everything. We was in the bathroom. Yeah, the white <laughs> bathroom became the black bathroom. Cause That's we hilarious. wrote shit, all kinds of jingles on the wall, and then we come out. So I got asked that by a student once. He said, well, Mr. Ambrose, when was the first time you were published? I said, on the bathroom wall. That's funny. <laughs> at my high school. I says, and then on the wall at Sears and Roebuck department store, a bunch of feet stories up in the air, we painted Blackstone Ranger Territory. Wow. Walk in danger, stranger, walk in fear. Mighty, mighty Blackstone Rangers all up in here. So you knew you were in the wrong neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the stuff that moved us on the street back then, you know. And it was a way I felt, I think, I think there was a sense of uh, powerlessness, and That's my generation, yeah. we were born. Uh, we were born to be provocative, you know, and to challenge things that had gone before us in our parents' generation. We were born to do what we were doing. So yeah. that's interesting you say that because that's how I really feel about y'all. And then like you watch some of the older generation like. That, I feel like that fire is gone when you see younger generation of black people, you know, uh, going up against the status quo when it comes to like gay rights and trans rights. It's just like how do, how does this generation go from being provocateur to like, nah, you, we, we shouldn't be doing that. And, I, and I, I'm not trying to compare the black yeah. his civil yeah. rights to gay or trans because I don't I don't like comparing strife and, right. and right. all that kind of stuff. But it's just weird to me, like to see the generation of people that were that came up with this this fire to be pr provocative and to, to see it go out and almost become opposite as they, they got older. And I'm starting to see it with my generation. Yeah. Like people who like Ron DeSantis, I'm like, even some of my white friends, I'm like, but you used to like NWA and all this kind of stuff. I thought you was actually cool, but now you're hitting your forties and all of a sudden you anti hip hop. You don't like black people anymore. And it's just like half of y'all tried to dress and, and talk like us. Yeah. Until you were like 22. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you just anti-black all the way. You don't like the music no more. Like what is wrong with you? Like what, what? I wonder what happens to us. Yeah. Yeah. That That's an interesting question because <laughs> something did happen to me along the way. I had people that thought, you know, now let me tell you this, though, because you asked that first question, that, that other question that dealt with how I came to be. Yeah. That and I think it started with that, with the sketching and all of that. I wasn't reading a lot of it. I wasn't hearing a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But I'd hear clips of Malcolm X at times and others and it would catch my attention. He sounded different than Dr. King. But things he was saying I agreed with, you know, more. You know, I agreed with what he was saying. You know, the ballad of the bullet. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they attack us, we attack them, you know, so yeah. forth. These were things I was hearing that agreed with me. Because why? Because no matter how conciliatory and how peaceful and how accommodating we were to the other folks, they, don't they give spit a on us, they stomped yep. on us, they called us names, they were violent towards us. I knew that that had to stop. I felt that we were being bullied by a whole race of people, and I was not going to stand for it. Yeah. You know, it, me, on my little space, I felt that in my little space, I'm standing up in my little space, but I joined the gang so I didn't have to stand by, by myself. myself. Right. 
And, and that's, so so yeah. then, then we were, you know, okay, we, we got some, we can fight y'all back. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. But America taught me <laughs> hatred. America did. And I say America did because America didn't uh, didn't do anything to curtail my education in hatred. Uh, they were, if anything, they were stoking the flames of hatred in a young black generation who had not yet come to terms with its own identity. Right. So they taught us hatred. Uh, I remember us getting in gang fights and we were shooting each other and killing each other. And, and, and it, it, it became so horrific and... Uh, 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 how life was just being extinguished, and we were youngsters, we were teenagers, and in just one angry. year, I one uh, five month period, I lost. In six month period, I lost five friends. All of them, we had grown up together. Mm -hmm. We had did paper routes together. We had done a, a lot of things together. Each of them were coming up dead. Mm. Um, I was afraid to even go home, you know. Uh, they were into our neighborhoods. They were the other gang. The other gang was the devil's disciples, mm -hmm. you know, and we were rivals in the territory uh, at that time. Uh, I wouldn't know anything about it today It's so many years later. Right. Uh, but Harold Branch and I became very good friends. We went in the gang together. We went down together, you know, in all of that. And we fought together, side each other, and all of that. Uh, and five of our friends were dead. And it was just him and I out of the seven friends. Okay, left. And he didn't come to school. And it scared me to death. Uh -huh. And I, oh, man, what happened? And I got out and I immediately went to his house. Oh, he left, but he didn't come back. He, he went to school or something. He didn't come. You didn't see him at school. No, ma'am. I left and I went to every place we hung out. I went to all under the L tracks. I went to uh, Chili Max. Uh, I went to different places that we hung out. Couldn't find nowhere, nowhere. And finally, I think a day or two, two days later, I'm standing at the bus stop. And here he comes walking up with two brothers from the nation of islam and he has on a bow tie harold does now yeah a bow tie his hair was cut short you know and he was one of them had pretty hair you know he had the the, the long brown hair the mm -hmm. pretty negro you know he had the long hair and stuff but he had it cut all the way down to a crew cut you know and a bow tie and he was dressed up and all of that and he said hey man i salam alaikum i say i said who <laughs> and he, he said, that's peace. That's peace, Negro. See, you're a so-called Negro. You have to learn, as alaikum. That means peace be unto you. Jesus said that when he greeted people. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I said, Harold, where the hell you been? I've been looking everywhere for you. I said, I've been sick. I've been worried sick. We don't know who's going to get shot or something. Wait, where you been? Uh, hey, man, I'm down. I've been down here at the mosque. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, why you go there? He said, well, uh, my uncle, I told him that you and me, we we was tired of this gang stuff, but we didn't know how to get out. Uh, and he told me that you don't get out of no gang in Chicago. He said, unless you dead, you get out dead. <laughs> you know, right. he says, so you ain't, still stay he says, you're in the game. You know too much. You're too much involved. No, he says, you're in it. The only way, he said, I can think of, go to the mosque because the gangs don't fuck with the Muslims. Yeah, <laughs> they don't. They won't fuck with the Muslims. <laughs> He says, double Muslims. Yeah. <laughs> Richard probably them double Muslims. <laughs> you know, say, yeah. Uh, and he says, uh, and he says, so that's what I said, uh 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 uh. I said, man, he said, you got to go with me, right? Go with I said, I ain't going to no mosque, man. I'm a Christian. He said, no, you got, you don't have to be no Muslim. He said, just be a Christian, just be seen going in the mosque 
with the brothers. Be seen with the brothers on the street pushing the paper, right? That, he said, that's what you do. He right. says, and then they're going to let you alone. They see you out there and they see who you with. They ain't going to fuck with you, man. They ain't fucking with them Muslims, man. Yeah. You know, and he said, I said, oh, oh, no, no. I ain't cutting my hair like that, nigga. I ain't cutting my hair like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and that <laughs> silly bow tie, I ain't wearing no silly bow tie, you know, and so forth. And he says, oh, man, this ain't this is cool, though, you know. And I said, I don't like all that. He said, you don't have to do all this. He said, look, hey, Ambrose, Ambrose, all you got to do is be seen on Wednesday. When we go in on Wednesday, Nick, this was Friday. Right. We go in on <clears throat> Wednesday, you know, and and when you go there, just they play games and talk about different things. It's social night. It's social night. You don't have, I said, I don't want to hear no preaching, none of that. He said, well, you, do you know what they preach about? I said, no, I just don't want to. Mm -hmm. I know what Malcolm preached about, and they killed him. I said, they killed Malcolm. And I said, I think them niggas did it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. that's how I thought. That's mm -hmm. how I thought. And uh, he says, oh, man. He said, come on, Ambrose, man. We went down together. We should separate out that thing together and be together on this. Right. I said, oh, I don't know. He says, come on, man, next Wednesday. He said, be, meet me at Chili Max under the railroad tracks is where we would go after church. And there was the Chili Mac place, and there was an old dude in there that would buy us Boone's Farm wine and get us white port and lemon juice mm -hmm. and stuff when we was kids, right? right? He would go in and cop for us, and we'd give him a buck or two so he could get him something to drink, right. you know, that type of thing. And... uh I was supposed to meet him there that next Wednesday. But on that next Tuesday, um, somebody came, well, two guys that were dangerous fellows from the disciples were in our neighborhood. And I was hiding under the steps, uh, under the steps of my house, there's a lattice, a wooden lattice around it, so you can't see uh, inside, but I could see outside. And I saw them coming up on the porch, rang the doorbell. They asked my little brother where I was at, my brother Vince. And my brother said, he's not here, he's still at school, I think. He said, what you want with him? Yeah, that's all right, little nigga. You know, just tell him we was here looking for his ass. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's when my grandmother, who is it? What y'all want? You know, oh, ma'am, it's nothing. We just friends to Ambrose. We just was trying to see where Ambrose was, you know, that type of thing. She said, well, he's not here right now. And who shall I tell him called on him? And she, and he said, well, you know, it's just at Eddie's. Tell him Fast Eddie came. And uh, she said, all right, Fast Eddie. She says, okay. And uh, so, you know, uh, they left, went on up the street. I followed them with my grandfather's snub nose 38. I followed him, and I followed him to the barber shop that I grew up getting my hair cut in. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in my Do family. Do you want to tell the rest of the story? I don't know what statutes of limitation are. You might want, well, you might want to be careful. Yeah, well, the, the, my, my grand, <laughs> my, uh, uh, so. <laughs> the, <laughs> you don't have to say exactly what happened. <laughs> so what happened was we got involved uh at uh, I followed them. I went to the the barber shop, Mr. Taylor's barber shop. I've known him since I was five years old. He cut my uncle's hair. He cut my daddy's hair. It was like that in the mm -hmm. neighborhood. He was right. well known. It was a well known barber. They had a pool hall in the back of the barber shop. And so when you That's come old in, school. yeah, they had a stoop, a three step stoop. You stepped in, mm -hmm. and then the barber shop was over here. And then back uh, down the hall, back there in the back was the pool hall, mm -hmm. and nobody was there but these two goons. They were in there talking and bragging about killing my best friend, Chester. And uh, I don't know what I intended to do with the gun once I got close to them, really. I just wanted the gun for protection. Mm -hmm. um, 
as the old saying goes, in our streets, it's better to be caught with it than without it. You right. know, that type of thing. And uh, I, I stepped in and they couldn't see me because I was in the shadow. And they just had a light, that two lights that were pendant lights over the table. So the rest of the room was kind of darkish, like you couldn't ca- hardly see things, you know. Right. And I was standing there, and they were just talking. And they, you know, yeah, you put that, you know, you put some some lead in that nigga, you know. And he said, oh, nigga, if I hadn't shot that nigga, he'd have beat your ass. He had you all on the, on the ground, you know, that kind of thing. He says, well, at least we ain't got no witnesses. No, I'm the witness, nigga, you know, and, uh, and this, that, and the other. And I, I would not have understood or known how I would react if I heard something like that. Uh, I didn't expect, I, I th- thought they did it, right? But I didn't know they, they did it. They confirmed it. And then he, in a sense, confessed it. Right. Uh, <clears throat> going through it right there, you know. And I was in shock. Immediately, you know, and I had the gun. I pulled it out, and I, I aimed it their direction. And I that's just... where we're gonna stop the story. <laughs> we're not. We, yeah, we're gonna stop it there. That's so, it. We're not gonna to, tell the rest of that. Suffice it to say that when I stepped out <laughs> of the uh, alleged the barber shop, uh, the ambulance was coming for them, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, and old Mr. Taylor took the gun from me and, 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 and told the guy in the barber, call, call the emergency, call the ambulance. And he said, don't call the police, call the ambulance. You mm-hmm. know, and he told me, let the gun go, son. He pinned me up against the wall. Hey, let the go, gun go, son. The Lord have mercy, your grandma going to have a fit. You know, Man. and he, he took it and he says, oh, Lord, he says, Get out of here, son. Get out of here. You go to your auntie's house. Don't go back to your house. Go to your auntie house and stay there till they can figure out what to do. He said, I'll take care of this here. Dang. That, that was what he did. I stepped out on the stoop on the corner right there, right near the barber shop was a paper stand. And the old white man at the paper stand was holding up the newspaper, extra, extra, read all about it. They done killed the king. The king is dead. And I heard that Dr. King got assassinated at that moment. Wow. And I heard old women screaming, cars three or four, car collisions happened right at the intersection. People wasn't paying attention and they were in shock. So I heard scars, uh, screeching tires and bang, bang, bang. People crying. People crying, on the street crying. It was the craziest thing in the world. It was like some kind of damn movie or something. It was surreal. Things were moving in slow motion, but you knew it was going Fast, like rapidly, things were moving rapidly. Right. And I didn't, I don't even know what happened between that place and where my auntie lived, which was at least uh, more than a half hour away. I know I must have caught the train or the bus or but something. You, you don't remember? I don't remember any of it. Man, when that's When I woke crazy. up, I was on the couch, sofa in my auntie's living room. I heard talking in the kitchen, my auntie's two aunties, their voices, and I saw, looked over, and I saw a suitcase, right? And uh, and I was trying to get up, and I, I kind of went to the kitchen, and my auntie said, oh, there he is, there he is. Baby, go in and get dressed. Get Go in and get yourself washed up uh, so you can have some breakfast. You want some breakfast? And I, it, I couldn't, you know, I was in such a, a state that I, I I, it was like tunnel vision. Right. It's like I couldn't see any. I didn't have any peripherals. And right. I, it, it was dark and, and like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, okay. So I was kind of moving just out of rote, you know, and brushing my teeth and having a shower and all that. And I looked up 
they had my new Easter suit hanging up in the bathroom. We, you know, my cousins and my uncles, and we all went to Layla Wares and a couple of the haberdasheries. Right. You, you know how black folk get dressed up for Easter. Especially you in know, Chicago, so That huh? was a serious time going, right. you know, getting we getting three pieces and the shoes, the floor shimes and Stetsons, and mm-hmm. we, you know, you get clean in Chicago, you know. Yeah. And uh, so we had all my stuff hanging up there, and that was weird, you know. It was April. You know, and it was going to be Easter, and uh, the uh, I remember uh, uh, they just humored me. I didn't understand why they weren't talking about it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I I knew they had to must know something, you know, but I didn't know if they did. Right. You know, and they didn't let on. And they told me, your, your grandfather and grandmother, they're going to be here in a minute, and we're going to go for a little ride. And I said, yes, ma'am. And uh, put on the clothes. We don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. And uh, my grandfather, uh, they packed me up, and... Uh, made me sit in the front seat. My grandfather, my uncle opened the door for me to get in. And I sat down and he says, we're gonna, we're gonna go for the ride, son. And uh, we don't want you to get scared about this. But we're gonna take care of things here. But we gotta get you out of this city else you're gonna get killed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember driving through the city the last time in my grandpa's 1968 Cadillac sedan DeVille. And, and I didn't know it for sure, but I just felt this is the last time I'm going to see my city, you know. And we drove through, went to the train depot. Then my grandmother explained to me, I was, you're going to your other grandma. She lives in, in Arizona. She's, she's your father's mother. You met her when you were a child, but they are excited for you to come there, Roddy. They want you to be with them. And I said, mm, I got to go away. You know. I'm going to get us out. You know how it happens, right? Yeah. Let me get it. I'll, I'll get us out. Hey, look, everybody. Thank you all so much for listening to my, my father-in-law. As you can tell, these are some very, very, very uh, emotional and serious stories. Uh, but these are very important stories to hear, not only for my family, but this is black history. And this is why I really wanted to have him on, just to get his backstory for y'all to see and hear uh Black history is alive and well in this country. People think that, like, all this stuff is old. These people are gone. They're here. It's my father-in-law. This is one of millions of stories of black men and black people around this country. So I just want to say thank you so much for checking out uh, the Chris Allen Show. Uh, See you all next week. We're out of here. Thank you so much. Peace.